to you to our regional interfaith dialogue um, under the auspices of SAFC, Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you here today. And there are representatives here from um, across Southern Africa, from Tanzania, from Zimbabwe, from, um, we were supposed to have a few people from Malawi, and I see, um, I see many people from, from all over. And it's really well, wonderful to have this conversation. It's the first in a series of, um, of interfaith dialogues. So the, the first one is the subject is about energy and climate justice. And this is an area that SAFC is particularly interested in. And just to give you a little bit of context um, around this, SAFC works with faith leaders, um, encouraging faith leaders to um, engage in eco-justice because we do believe that we are there to model um, and to teach our people. And the point of today is really, to, we, are we are all teachers, but what is it that our sacred texts are teaching us? And how can we learn from each other and from each other's sacred texts? And how do we strengthen and enrich each other in our, in our daily work to connect um, and not only with God, but also with the earth and with all of creation what is our place in all of creation and today's subject of course is energy and climate justice my hope is that by the end of today we will be able to agree um, or find points of agreement to um to really be able to say you know we we are in this together this is one planet and we, what are our points of agreement and even if we have different religions um and how, how, do we, how do we support each other to go forward? So those are the things that I needed to tell you about today. To save bandwidth, if you are not speaking, you are very welcome to keep your um, camera off today. However, we will ask you to put your camera on when we have a photograph. Um, one of our staff members, Philippine, is here to, um, to fulfill that function for us today. And, Zainab is also here. Many of you know Zainab. Zainab is, is our, our gatekeeper and she's also our um, timekeeper today. So she will be making sure that keeping us all on track. And thank you Zainab for that, for that um, acknowledgement. And then also before we start, I have to tell you this because otherwise I'm going to get into this wonderful conversation and forget to tell you that there are some wonderful events coming up with um, for, with SAFC. So as you know, on the 1st of September was the start of the season of creation. Now the season of creation is not just for, um, it's not just for Christians, it is for everybody. And we are running something called an earth picket, an earth keeper picket. And what that means is that we've invited faith leaders, all faith leaders to, when you're wearing your your um, your garments, your attire, that is your faith leader's attire that shows who you are, we're going to ask you to hold a placard and take a picture. And the placard is going to actually say one thing that you um, would like to share with, with your congregation or your community about what you think being an earth keeper is about and how you, um, how that speak, how you express your faith through earth keeping. So that's number one that I wanted to tell you about. It's on our social media. It, um, and um, it is, I think it's going to be in our newsletter as well. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to connect with um, me or Zainab. And on the 5th of October, which is World Habitat Day, we will be sharing our photographs on social media to show people all around our region um, what the faith leaders are doing to, to show and to promote the own awareness of how we work with the earth. So that's the one thing I needed to tell you. The second thing I needed to tell you is that next week on Thursday at 10 o'clock, we have um, a gathering where we're going to be inviting faith leaders to come and hear about our small grants um, process. So we have a small grants project um, and it is to support our faith leaders 
in eco-justice work that they're doing around Southern Africa. And if you want to hear more about that, we will be issuing that invitation very, very soon. So I think that those are the only things I re really needed to tell you about. Um, and yeah. So without further ado, I want to bring you apologies from Francesca, our executive director, as well as from Wayne Duplessis, who is our operations manager. Unfortunately, they are stuck in load shedding and they are unable to get online right now. Um, and we fully understand that that is something over which we have no control. Thank you to all of you who are here and um, and I'm sure it's going to be an exciting day. I also have not seen Molina Samik Nordin and Father John Ngoma. Both of those were going to be our opening prayers for today. So I wonder if there's somebody who would, uh, thank you Tamsin for sharing our Earthkeeper picket in the chat. If you could download that, that would be wonderful information for you. Please could I ask somebody to volunteer to open with a prayer. Um, thank you, Reverend Barry. God bless you. Uh, shall we pray? Uh, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, praise your name. We thank you so much for the Earth Keepers. Father, may you begin with us in this session, in this conversation. Father, we bless your name. Uh, you, are, you have created the earth from the beginning. Father, may you bless us to nature, to keep it, and to bless your land. Father, thank you for the participants from start to finish. Start with us and end with us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that enormously, Reverend, um, Reverend Turai. And it's my first time of meeting you, so that's wonderful. Is there somebody from another faith who would like to also open in prayer? I wonder if um, Rabbi Julia Margolis is in the room. We might have lost her to load shedding. But perhaps somebody would like to open. I'm sorry, if you could just go around to the gate, please. So if somebody would like to open in um, somebody else. I think we have lost um, Rabbi Margolis. Rev Marutu, would you like to also say a prayer, please? We'd like to have a couple of, um, of opening prayers because we need as many blessings as we can get. You're muted. You're muted, Rev. <laughs> Sorry, Rev, but you're still muted. Let's pray. Okay, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank for this special moment and the time which you give us as faith leader to discuss about the issue of the environment, specific in the issue of the climate justice and the renewable energy. We need your wisdom. We need your Holy Spirit to be with us to discuss this important uh, matter for our world. Guide us with wisdom and Holy Spirit. We expect through these discussions, God will show us the way in order of protecting our Earth Mother. Amen. 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 Yes. So with that, um, I'm going to um, introduce uh, the people who are on the South Sea staff briefly. I've told you about Zainab. She is here and Philippine is here. Um, and Tamsin, I believe, is also with us. And we are part of the SAFSI team that is, um, that is working hard to uh, support the process of, of eco-advocacy throughout Southern Africa. Um, Philippine, would, would you like to take the photograph now? 
could we all put our, our um, videos on, please? So we have two screens, it seems. So I'm going to have to take the picture twice. Um, I'm waiting for those who can to um, switch on their cameras. So I'm going to take on the count of three, the first one. One, two, three. Okay, I've just taken the first one. I'm going to take the second one just now. You're ready where you are, and I see someone still moving. It's written Galaxy Grand Prime. Should we wait for you? Okay, I'm not sure if they can hear me. I'm gonna take one, one, two, three. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you so much, Philip Tyne. Um, our, I'm just getting the agenda up in front of me. Okay. So I would like to just introduce, first of all, um, our first speaker is Rabbi Julia Margolis. Um, she is um, from the um, progressive Jewish movement in Gauteng, and she is one of very few women rabbis in South Africa, um, and I've had the honor of meeting her a few times and just being so deeply moved by, um, by her passion and commitment to her work and to her community and to growing her um, her brand of advocacy, which is a really, really special, a special brand in the world today. And I'm sorry, I see that I have somebody who is trying to get hold of me and let's just ignore them for now. Um, so Rabbi Julia um, will be bringing us the Jewish perspective on, um, on energy and climate change. And um, I have then asked Zainab, actually, to introduce the other three speakers because she knows them a lot better than I do. Thank you, Zainab. Oh, <laughs> didn't know I was on now. Um, thank you, Reverend Perry. Um, yes, so one of our speakers is um, for those that doesn't know, SAFSI has a program called um, Faith Leader Environmental Advocacy Training Program, which we, in short, we call it FLEET program. And it's um, um, training of faith leaders and capacity building. And it's been on for about five years now. And so our speakers are mainly from there, um, one of which is Reverend Elisa Marutu from Same, Tanzania, um, who is on the Fleet One program, who, is, who has also done lots of work um, on environment for his organization, Hope for Tanzania. Um, and um, he's also a Lutheran Reverend in his congregation. Um, and then we have Reverend, um, Rebecca Tendai Gurupira, Mrs. Rebecca uh, Gurupira, who is from Zimbabwe, from the United Methodist Church in Zimbabwe. Um, and she has been working with um, women groups within her congregation. And we also have Reverend R Rumalan, who's from the Unitarian Church. So he's here as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Rabbi Julia, are you still with us? If Rabbi Julia is not with us, she has in fact sent me a statement that I would like to read on her behalf. Um, she is having load shedding at the moment, which I know many of us are experiencing. And she was hoping to stay with us for as long as she could, but unfortunately that just, um, hasn't happened clearly. So if I'll just bring this up so that I can read it for you. Uh, 
Bye bye, Julia writes. The reform movement, the reform Jewish movement, is committed to protecting the environment and ensuring a just, healthy, and safe future for generations to come. The science is clear. Global climate change and pollution threaten our communities. We have a sacred responsibility to care for the earth and its inhabitants by advocating for sustainable policies, addressing climate change, promoting clean air and water, and protecting wildlife. In doing this work, we must also ensure environmental justice, protecting those who have been disproportionately impacted by climate change and advocating for a just transition away from fossil fuels. Through our environmental advocacy, we carry on a Jewish tradition of stewardship and partnership in the ongoing work of creation dating back to Genesis. Why should Jews care? The Torah teaches that humankind was created on earth in part to care for and protect God's creation. We read that in Genesis 2.15. The Talmudic concept of Baal Tashit, do not destroy, was developed by the rabbis as an assertion of God's holy ownership of the land. We show our commitment to creation and to each other by preventing the destruction and degradation of our planet. As is said in my powerful Midrash, do not destroy my world, for if you do, there will be nobody after you to make it right again. And that is Midrash Ecclesiastes Rabbah 7.13. It is our responsibility to preserve, protect, and nourish our planet. We have the power to take action to create a healthy and just future for ourselves and generations to come. Jewish tradition emphasizes many values that speak to our nation's need for energy policies that are environmentally responsible and that pay due attention to the public health and safety of both future and present generations. Humankind has a solemn obligation to improve the world for future generations. Addressing climate change requires us to learn how to live within the ecological limits of the earth so that we will not compromise the ecological or economic security of those who come after us. Genesis 2.15 emphasizes our responsibility to protect the integrity of the environment so that its diverse species, including humans, can thrive. The human being was placed in the Garden of Eden to till it and to tend it. Similarly, Jewish tradition teaches us that human domain over nature does not include a license to abuse the environment. The Talmudic concept, Baal Tashit, do not destroy, was developed by the rabbis into a universal doctrine that dramatically asserted God's ownership of the land. Psalm 24 notes, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And from this basic concept, it follows that any act of destruction is an offense against the property of God. Energy policy must also be equitable and just as the Torah commands justice. That was um, from Rabbi Julia. And I know that she is still struggling to connect, um, but we give thanks that she was able to have the foresight to um, prepare and send that statement along to us, which for me seems like a really good place to start from. So I think that um, we'll, invite, um, we'll invite Reverend Marutu um, to bring us a Lutheran pers perspective next. Reverend Marutu, are you ready? For us, would you like to put your? You can unmute and put your um, your camera on so that we can see you. Thank you, sir. There you go. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Barry, for these times. 
Um, as you say, I can talk about the perspective of Lutherans. Uh, for the church, the concept of environmental responsibility and climate justice stem out of its theology, ethics and spirituality. When theolo theological and spiritual perceptions are weak or distorted, human attitudes and behavior are likely to treat creation with levity and laxity. Actually, we know in the, in the opening chapter of the book of Genesis, describes an unfolding process of creation at the end of which God locally at what he had done. All of which was very good. Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 31. Creation was pleasant to dwell in and peace and in harmony with itself and its creator. Human responsibility for creation is recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden uh, of Eden to cultivate and guard it. Cultivation, the care and guarding of the environment was and still remains humankind's fund fundamental privilege and responsibility. And when we look in the the, uh, uh, the issue of the, we have the issue of the uh, Adam and Eva and Canaan and Abel in the Bible, but the destruction of every living creature on the earth with the Lord flood was because the Lord saw how bad the people on the earth were and that everything they thought and planned was evil and cruelty and violence have spread everywhere. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. There are through patents and plan brought evil. In other words, Noah did the right things. Sin and the creation. The, the environmental crisis the world is facing today is one big demonstration of the gravity of the destructive power of sin and how excessively this can affect the well-being of others. Our own and our society attitudes and behavior have a direct impact on creation. The person and corporate question that will be that kind of meaning and spirituality do other great things bring to us when if you were encounter them is our world and one which revolves around us or do consider that we share everything with others the call for climate justice and equity the flow of water in streams and rivers point us to the flow of the life as we drink it and use it in a numerous aspects of our lives Water is a major constant of the human body and other living things. Draining water the ground and causes plants to sprout. Tragical wind spread pollution of water from the fuel combustion toxic waste and oil spillage means that millions are unable to have safe drinking water. The topsoil. Open play all isn't only the source of our daily food, but the means of livelihood for seven I get in subsistent farming of equal importance is that these first few and the creature who share the soil with us. When climate conditions blow or wash off of, of this topsoil, it brings untold hardship, suffering and death to many people, livestock and creature. The purest people of the world are already suffering the effect of changing climate through the, these poor folk have done to list to bring about the present climate condition. They have been uh, the first to feel the impact of it and bear the brunt of it. Marita, we're losing your sound. Some of the facts to consider is we think about today, rich nations are responsible. Today, rich nations where only about 
percent of the world population resides have emitted for many greenhouse gas emissions. They have faced the biggest responsibility. Rich countries, therefore, must support developing nations adapting to avoid the polluting uh, easier and cheaper. Path to limit through, uh, uh, through uh, uh, account for just for past four percent of carbon dioxide emission. Fifty-five percent of the world carbon dioxide emissions are produced by the G8 country alone. The environmental consequence of the policy of industrialized nations have had a large and costly effect of developed countries, especially the poor and poverty. Developing world debt and poverty has divided immense resources from sustainable development. It is unfair to expect the Olympic world to make emission reduction in the same way. Industrial nations should have uh, over $50 billion to European nation for assessed cause of climate change. Also, development countries will also be tackling climate change in other way, market and energy growth. Development alternative fuels to reduce energy imports aggressive energy efficiency program, use of the solar and renewable energy to rise living standard in rural location, reducing deforestation, slow population growth, and switching from coal to natural gas to diversify energy source and reducing uh, air pollution, a common obligation. The challenge to care for environment, our common heritage, is a collective and universal due to belong to all of humanity. This responsibility, not just for present, but also to protect the interests of future generations. It is a responsibility for the great concern as an individual, the church, community, national states, and the international community. To renew the earth, we must be in solidarity with one another because we are all in this together. All the stakeholders must get involved in we need to make a strong commitment to adopt a more environmental friendly lifestyle. For us as a, as a, as a, as a Christian, we need a knowledge building program about the effect of climate change and what needed to be done. Political advocacy will be necessary to set a standard for best practice uh, in emission by industry developing environment policy. In acting climate regulatory laws, together a compensation for climate damage cause. The church should also bring uh, issues of climate change, justice and environmental responsibility and responsibility in her worship life. Also to consider renewable energy as a source, especially solar, as a source for, uh, for, 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 for energy, for, uh, farm, uh, for environmental friendly in Africa. Thanks so much for listening me. Hello. Thank you so much, Rev Marutu. I really appreciate that. And you know, you, you bring to mind something that I read recently that said of the something like 325 days of the year in sub-Saharan Africa are sunshine days. And yet something like 2% mm. of houses, of homes in sub-Saharan Africa are actually electrified. Um, and, and it just doesn't really make sense in that respect. It's, um, it just... Um, just picking up from those 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 points that you made, um, and yes, it definitely is a collective issue, which is I think the benefit of these of these dialogues. So thank you so much for that, Reverend. I am going to ask um, Tendai. Okay, thank you. She's ready. And uh, sorry, before we move on to Tendai, I just need to check with um, Reverend Rutu. You yes. sent us a presentation. Did you not? You don't want us to show that presentation now, or can we keep that? Or what? What would you like us to do with that? Well, let's be. Maybe you can hear Tendai, and then you can back to another presentation. So you can. I can see you in PowerPoint. Okay. okay All right. Okay. Super. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Tendai, we also have a, a presentation for uh, that you sent through. Would you like Zainab to share her screen? Yes. Thank you. Zainab, uh, you can go ahead. 
I am on it. Of course you are. <laughs> Thank you. Is it showing, Betty? Yeah, it is. Okay. Okay, should I carry on? Yes, please. Carry on. Okay, thank you. To Zainab, Reverend Biri, other presenters, and all faith leaders who are here, I'm happy to present to you uh, on what our church is saying about energy and climate change. Um, as United Methodists, we believe that all creation belongs to God and we are responsible for the ways in which we use and abuse it. Energy resources are to be valued and conserved as they are God's creation, not, and not solely because they are useful to human beings. God granted us stewardship over his creation. And when we go to Oh no, that looks like she's frozen. Lena? Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, let's just give it a second. Betty, do you want to read off the presentation? Because I think she's reading off the presentation. Sure, I'll do that. Um, so we should meet these stewardship duties through acts of love, care, respect, and social, economic, and political conservation, technological developments that, um, that will in turn lengthen and enrich our lives. Can you move on to the next slide? However, some of these developments have led to regional defoliation, dramatic extinction of species, massive human sufferings, and misuse of resources through overconsumption of natural and non-renewable resources, particularly by industrialized communities. And this continued course of action jeopardizes the natural heritage that God entrusted to all generations. Next slide, please, Zena. We are aware that current utilization of energy threatens the earth at its very foundation. As United Methodists, we are committed to approaching creation, energy production, and consumption of all energy resources in a responsible, careful, and economic way. We call upon all to take measures of energy conservation. Everybody should adapt his or her lifestyle to the average consumption of energy that respects the limits of the earth. Next slide, please. It is on the next slide. Um, Thank you. I think there's a bit of a delay, so it's fine. Oh, okay. We encourage people to limit uh, carbon dioxide emissions towards the goal of one ton per person annually. We strongly advocate for the priority of development of renewable energies. The deposits of carbon, oil, and gas are limited, and their continuous utilization accelerates global warming. Nuclear power use is no solution for avoiding carbon dioxide emissions. Nuclear power plants are vulnerable, unsafe, and potential health risks. A safe, permanent storage of nuclear waste cannot be guaranteed and it is therefore not responsible to future generations to operate them. Um, next slide. I see that there are some... Oh, thank you, Rue. I, just, I was going to say, I think there are some comments in the chat that I would go back to later, but obviously that's a really important one. Tendai, are you back with us? I think she's still struggling. The production of agricultural fuels and the use of biomass plants ranks lower than the provision of safe food supplies and the continued existence of small farming businesses. Cl 
climate justice is a term used to frame global warming as an ethical and political issue, rather than one that is purely environmental or physical in nature. As a church, we acknowledge the global impact of humanity's disregard for God's creation. Rampant industrialization and the corresponding increase in the use of fossil fuels have led to a buildup of pollutants in the Earth's atmosphere. These greenhouse emissions threaten to alter dramatically the Earth's climate with severe environmental, economic, and social implications. The adverse impacts of global climate change disproportionately affect individuals and nations least responsible for the emissions. Therefore, we support efforts of all governments to require ma mandatory reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and call on individuals, congregations, businesses, industries, and communities to reduce their emissions. We support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 7 aims to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. We encourage our members to invest in renewable energy, for instance, solar energy, wind farms, and biogas digesters, amongst others. As United Methodist Church, we also support the call for the decentralization of expensive energy resources and seek rapid adoption of mini grids and renewable energy technologies that are accessed equitably. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. If you can, you can stop Thank the speech. Um, ten, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for, um, and I don't know if Tendai has managed. Tendai, you made it back. Yeah, I'm back. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you made it back and thank you so much for um, being proactive and, and preparing that ahead of time so that when we had the technical glitch, we were able to continue. Um, and, and that was a really powerful statement and something that actually, um, the call to action there is very, very powerful and it's something that I'd love us to discuss. And we have one more speaker and then we'll go to the chat and see what there is to pull out of the chat to, um, to actually discuss and get into some of the meat of what is being brought to us today. So our final speaker is Rue. There you are. And the floor is yours, Rue. Thank you, uh, Barry, and uh, good afternoon to all the participants and fellow, uh, fellow uh, panelists. Uh, uh, and thank you, Barry and uh, Zainab, for the, um, the opportunity to, to share with you today. Um, I, I believe that what we have in common this afternoon is our, uh, our desire to act on environmental concerns. And uh, I would like to share some perspectives of Unitarians um, on, on climate change and uh, energy. Um, and so as Unitarians, we uh, express our shared core beliefs uh, as seven principles that was adopted by the American Unitarian Universalist Association in 1984. Uh, and I will definitely not be able to cover all seven of those principles in, in 10 minutes. So therefore I will focus only on those principles that are really relevant to the energy and uh, climate justice concerns. But I thought I will just share with you and I'll put it in the chat, uh, a file uh, with the three principles that I uh, am going to cover. And so you're welcome to maybe look at that uh, while I'm talking. Uh, and so I would like to start with uh, the seventh Unitarian principle um, and also read it in combination with the sentence that actually precedes each one of these seven Unitarian principles. And so the seventh Unitarian principle reads, uh, as you will find on, on that document that I put into the chat, we Unitarian Universalist covenant to 
affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. A long sentence uh, that covers actually a lot of ground, but I think most importantly is to notice the, the word in that very first sentence that uh, the word covenant, because uh, through that word, we as Unitarians signify that these Unitarian principles originate from a sacred agreement and a commitment between ourselves and others and all life forms on the planet, as well as that which we all hold dear spiritually or specifically spiritually. Um, and so it's a sacred agreement that we enter into as we share uh, these principles. Maybe to use a Christian, the Christian vocabulary, um, it's a commitment to be grounded in faith, in love and in hope as we do the, this work. And so with the seventh Unitarian principle, uh, it suggests that it's impossible to truly do the work of climate justice without a real deep understanding and appreciation of our place within this beautiful and amazing interdependent web of life in which all of us participate. It highlights the, the need for us to care for our planet or Pachamama, as South Americans call it so beautifully. And we also need to take care of our ecosystems and our economy. Uh, and it's uh, very indicative that those two words actually starts with the same uh, uh, word eco, because those two are actually very intertwined with each other as far as energy is concerned on our planet. And so the seventh principle also highlights the need for us to support sustainable communities that ensure that we live within the ecological limits of the earth or Pachamama's ability to regenerate herself while meeting the needs of our present generation, but without compromising those of future generations, which is our children and our grandchildren and those who come after them. And it's therefore uh, suggests also that energy and climate justice are deeply intertwined with the relationship between us as a human family. And this is what our second principle alludes to when it then says we covenant to affirm and promote justice, equity and compassion in all human relationships. What this means is that we need to take care and be concerned about those most vulnerable to the impact of environmental destruction and to focus our efforts on raising awareness on their struggles and the solutions to them. And um, Reverend Berry has already alluded to the ability to use sunlight in order to to give people access to, uh, to, to energy. And so there's many solutions that we can find in order to, to help with those burdens. Uh, we also, for example, know that women in particular are one of those vulnerable groups, as well as those who live with limited uh, resources as some of the other speakers also has alluded to already. And so in the course of uh, this, uh, uh, or, or rather this of course also raised the issue of energy and the economy and how we ensure that within our context, the most vulnerable have access to energy in all its forms to sustain their lives in a dignified way. In fact, that's actually our first principle, uh, the dignity of all human beings. Um, but I didn't really allude to do that uh, in, in the document. So, uh, but rather focus then on the fourth principle, which says that, uh, the, uh, that Unitarians uh, um, 
uh, affirm and promotes a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And so there's two areas that are important to us here. There is no question uh, in our mind that we as faith communities need to work together, need to work together to realize these goals, uh, to protect the earth and care for each other. And that we also have a sacred duty to nurture, and for me, this is quite important, to nurture the stories told by our particular communities, our faith, to strengthen our resolve, to bring rest restoration to the earth, uh, and to dignity to all fellow human beings and all living beings for that matter. Uh, and uh, some of our speakers already has beautifully quoted from the Bible and from the Torah. Uh, and so each of us uh, has different sacred stories that speak about nature and speak about that sense of care for each other. Uh, and so we need to tell those stories also to each other and share them. Whether we are Buddhist, Christian, Islam, uh, from the indigenous traditions, humanist, or any other path. I recently read, and uh, I'm, a, I'm quite a bit of a follower of Gandhi, and uh, Gandhi said that, um, and, I, and I think this is really beautiful, he says that when doubt haunts me, when disappointments, disappointments stare me in the face, and when I see not one ray of light on the horizon, I turn to the Gita, which is the Hindu sacred text, uh, because uh, uh, Gandhi was, uh, um, as you know, probably know a Hindu. And then he says, he find a verse to comfort me. And I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming sorrow. And I think we all can follow Gandhi's example that when we find ourselves disappointed when we find ourselves downhearted uh, and overwhelmed by the work that uh, awaits us that we can also turn to the sacred text that's uh, sacred to us and find new comfort and renew hope um, i myself has recently studied the gospel of mark in detail again uh, and uh, find a lot of comfort and beautiful things that i didn't uh, didn't know and uh, uh, read before uh, in that text. And I must also admit that for me, one of the most beautiful sacred texts is nature, nature itself. Uh, I'm, I'm living near the beach and uh, there's no such, uh, uh, nothing more beautiful and nurturing than to walk on the, on the beach and feel the sand between your toes uh, and see the water and see the beauty of our planet. Uh, and so we can also turn to nature and give us that sustenance and, uh, and comfort. And then lastly, uh, in the same breath, we also need to pay attention uh, when we talk about that truth and meaning uh, to the various stakeholders in climate change and in energy, such, such as scientists and activists, and as well as the communities that are already affected by climate change so that we also will have the right information to act uh, upon that and to do the right things in order to help our planet uh, and our human family i want to close and uh, and just say i i know that we stand in front of great challenges but also great opportunities in facing and in facing these challenges I believe that we as faith communities are called to take care of the earth, but also to take care of our own bodies. We sometimes forget that we are also part of nature and uh, we need to take care of ourselves. But body also means, uh, as the New Testament uh, explains, it also means a body uh, as a community. So taking care of the bodies of our communities uh, that we are living with. And then lastly, we are also called to nurture the spirit that animates our body and the soul 
that sustains it. And we each have different ways that we do that. Uh, and I think it's very important for us in order to sustain this work, in order to, to also have a regular practice to do that. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share these thoughts and prayers with you. Uh, and uh, I look forward to, to our conversation that, uh, that will come up. Thank you so much, Reverend Rue Malung from the Unitarians of Cape Town. That was, um, that was actually wonderful. And you've also brought up a few things for me, and that is, for instance, in, in all of the nature traditions, we are as much in relationship with our environment as we are with each other. It's not separable. So, and as, as, um, as ministers of, of all faiths, of our, our story is really about relationship. It, it's all, we're all about relationship. So, so for me, um, and particularly thinking of the African tradition of Ubuntu, um, I am as much who I am because of the trees and the mountains and the environment around me as I am because of the people around me. So I can be without the people around me, but I will never be without the environment. There will always be an environment. So that is something um, that speaks very deeply into our experience and, um, and who we are as humans. Rue, I just want to point out that for me, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, the document that you put in the chat didn't come up. So I wonder if you'd like to email it to me or, or try again to put it in the chat or both. Okay, thanks, Rue. That that'll be great. I've I've been watching the chat and I see that um, oh yeah I see that there um, are a number of comments that have come up. Um, if you'd like to speak into the room to follow on from anything any of the speakers has said, please raise your hand or um, or give an indication. I can't see everybody, so. Um, so you can either raise your hand in the chat by by just going to the um, to the 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 group of letters under the group of options underneath the um, underneath the names of participant lists or doing what Gabriel has done. Which, yeah, Gabriel, I see your hand and you are invited to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Reverend Berry. Um, and thank you to all the presenters on the issues that they have raised. Um, coming from what I have noted in all their presentations is that uh, there is a general concern across all uh, faiths on the issue of the environment and on the issue of um, climate justice as well as the issue of um, the energy. Um, I would want us maybe as the faith communities to then start to proffer certain solutions at a local level, like you already mentioned, I read very, that um, we can start in small bits in our different communities and then begin to tell these stories of success of the conservation and the preservation of our different communities and the kind of um, energy alternatives that would have embarked on that we are using and share it widely so that when we begin to have other communities copying these, then we are beginning a revolution in small bits, but it will make a change. And even as we approach the policy makers, we'll then be in a position to actually say, we have done it, it has worked in these areas, we give them the evidence and then begin to try to make them put across uh, policy alternatives that would help us to go on and to help to reduce the carbon footprint that is so much ballooning at the moment. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Gabriel. Yes, you know, it's always the, a big question as, as to what one really can do to, um, to make a real difference. And I think that maybe that's one of the things we can actually look at our hashtag Earthkeeper project. Um, and that is really for faith leaders to take a stand because I hear, I, I read what you've been saying, what people have been saying in the chat group about, um, uh, about 
that there's often a political agenda that um, that the politics coming into um, these issues, these deep issues that affect all of us, um, that is not always a very good thing for us. Um, and how do we actually step out there and do something that makes a difference? So one of the ways we can do is by participating in collective action. Um, and, you know, collective action doesn't have to be hard work and it doesn't have to be heavy. It can actually be something joyful. For instance, the Earth Keeper picket where we invite you to take a photograph of yourself with all with your clerical garments on and holding a, um, a, a piece of paper on which you have written boldly um, your statement for the earth. So, so that's just one thing, but there are other obviously very, very um, serious points of advocacy that we can join in as well. Anybody else? Anybody else like to make a comment or or say anything more? Yes, Reverend Tarai, I see your hand, sir. Would you like to unmute? There we go. Yeah, yes, thank you, uh, Reverend Barry. Uh, I'd like to appreciate this because um, I think we are all in agreement that uh, this is something mm -hmm. that uh, all the earth keepers need to take up and um, as a way of moving forward yes. okay. with the agenda for for good earth keeping. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Reverend. You may continue. Oh, okay. Now, what, what, I, what, I'm, what I was going to proffer is um, we a lot, a lot of communities, a lot of uh, religious communities are doing a lot of work as far as the environment is concerned. But um, what I'm hoping would possibly try and enhance is uh, the collective effort, um, telling our stories together, uh, the stories in Malawi, the stories in Zambia, the stories in South Africa. Let's build that into one story. Um, so I'm looking at it from uh, possibly a a communications or a media perspective where we, we, we collect our stories together and tell it as one huge story. So I'm thinking that like for a Southern Africa, I'll, I'll tell you like, like in Zimbabwe, we have um, like the work that Rebecca Grupira does, um, like Friends of the Environment, there's a, an organization called Friend, Friends of the Environment that do plant trees. But um, in Zimbabwe, that's one project, but maybe there are other areas other projects, for example, in terms of protecting the environment. So if we collect all those images um, and all the stories do um, an audiovisual, things like that, that help tell our story. So I'm looking at it from a communications perspective that we can actually tell the story better as a, as a collective effort. Thank you. Betty, you on mute? You're going to have to rewind what you said. So sorry. Yes, I'll rewind. Um, yeah, th those are very useful suggestions and positive suggestions. And I thank you for that. And I'm hoping that um, Philippine and Tamsin are, are listening nicely because they're our communications team. And I know that they've been working on stories. And in fact, Zainab has been telling the stories um, on our website and on social media of many of our of our fleet participants, but I also know that maybe we could step that up a notch by creating a collective of stories. Um, and I think that's a fantastic idea. So would any, um, oh, Gur, Gur, I see that your hand is up. You are welcome to unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Reverend Barry, and uh, good morning to, uh, good afternoon to everyone. So I'm actually honored to be part of uh, uh, this panel, uh, this conference about uh, um, environment and the climate. So what actually uh, we, we're talking about here is about something that exists. And like one of the, um, uh, the brothers say, that we all concern about our environment. And that's true, because we are part of the nature and the nature is part of us. But what I'm trying to say here. 
no, did we just lose Go? Mm, it looks like it. Oh, hopefully he'll come back to us. Um, because it sounded really interesting what he was about to say. <coughs> Would anybody else like to comment in the meantime while Gur is... Oh, there's Gur. You're back. Yo. You're on mute? <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I think the, the, the connection that went... Uh, yeah. So I was saying, I'm talking about uh, uh, something that is common to everyone here. The protection of the nature of the environment. So... Um, but it's something I've noticed. We have spoken too much, actually. We have spoken too much. I think this is the time to stand up and take action. So I believe on taking action. Um, we have tried something similar. I'm from the Unitarian Church, like <laughs> Ru, Reverend Malan said. We are really uh, very uh, connected to the impact of what is happening in the nature. And we came up with an idea that we call uh, like a grassroots movement. We call Faith in Action Africa. So it's just a movement we started in South Africa with Reverend Ruma London I, but then we try to embrace more than 10 countries in Africa. And during the Mandela's International Day, we just ask people to come up with ideas, doing something good for the nature, to protect the nature. I can tell you the impact that we have was huge. And until today, we're still standing for, the take, for taking action, inspiring people to take action. All the, uh, the faith communities, I hear Ms. Ru taking, talking about the, the Gospel of Mark. Yes, and the God of, God of, Gospel of Mark ask us to go and bring the good news to the creation. And what is the creation? The creation is the human being in the nature, which means let care, take care of the nature, but starting by the small project, small thing, recycling project in our environment that will make differences. Really, we've been, we've been talking too much. Please, Reverend Barry, let's take action in our environment. This is my, uh, I would say my, uh, Advocates, I'm saying, let's go for actions. We can do better to protect our environment. We are part of the environment, and the environment is part of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gur, for your very passionate input. I appreciate that enormously. Lawrence, I see your hand, but before I come to you, I'm actually going to just um, go to the chat where um, Reverend Alison Harwood has put a very, very interesting comment about... Um, we need to revisit our theology of dominion. So as faith leaders, what are we actually teaching our communities regarding our theology of dominion? And how is that feeding into the um, ideas of ownership, of commercialism, of exploitation without even realizing it possibly, or isn't it? And how do we take responsibility for the theology that we are teaching our people? I'm just going to throw that question out there. And while you think about that, I'm going to invite Lawrence to unmute and have your say. Hello, Barry. Hello. Can you hear me, Lawrence? Can you see? Yes. Us? Yes, Barry. Hello, Barry. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I have. Oh. Sorry, I thought that was Lawrence speaking. Um, sorry, Reverend Marutu, someone yes, else is Reverend? going to speak and then we'll give you a chance. Hello, Thank everyone. You. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Um, I think from my own perspective and understanding and partially experienced uh, otherwise, I think uh, it's, it's, it, it has been a decade or more than a decade uh, since faith leaders have been advocating for environmental justice and uh, environmental conservation in a holistic approach. And I also think it's, for, it's, 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 it's on our ad advantageous point that we could also utilize this holistic approach uh, in partnering with the government parastatals 
because in as far as uh, development is concerned, we need uh, we need the government to recognize most of our initiatives. In, uh, since that um, these development initiatives, they won't go in vain or they won't just go like uh, stories which were written in history books, but achievements that we as our faith communities, we have achieved towards uh, environmental uh, advocacy. I will relate to one of the, my, 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 my past experiences where as a uh, faith leaders uh, advocacy trust of Zimbabwe, we partnered with uh, the Zimbabwe prisons uh, correctional service for a cleanup campaign. And one of the things that we got uh, through the evaluations is that those are uh, people in those government institutes, they are also part of the faith communities, but they need the voice that will stand on their behalf within the government legislation. So one way or the other, we need to develop, we need to, to design holistic uh, policies that will enable us to work with uh, other government parastatals like uh, in Zimbabwe, we've got the Environmental Management uh, Authority, EMA. And one of my colleagues who works there always ask me if my community could partner with them in any initiative they have because they might have the resources, they might have the green card to let us operate in each and every way we want, but our efforts toward partnering with them will also enable them to recognize each and every policy, each and every uh, suggestion that we have. They might incorporate it in the future in their policies since we need a holistic approach. And these parent setters, they also apply the holistic approach. It's just that we need to be partnering with them. We need to recognize them as they will recognize us. Thank you, Lawrence, for that. Um, yeah, putting together policies is, um, that, are, that, are, that we can all agree on is something um, maybe that's actually one of the things that can start that we can start to think about as part of a, a collective as we are. Um, but also we need that voice, as you say, we need to be able to connect with our politicians to, to implement those things. And that's not always that easy. I see that we have um, comments from Reverend Marutu and Rue and Zainab in that order. Um, I would, will take your comments. So Reverend Marutu first. Reverend Marutu, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, Mary. Thank you for a nice conversation concerning, I, I have good new ideas, especially concerning issue of the dominion theology, something like that. But I needed to share with you some true stories, very interesting from the Bible. The first one is about him, Adam and Eva. Eve. Uh, with sin, which is uh, gratification and promotions of the human sink beyond that appropriate to eating, come disharmony and distortions to the earth. For example, what is recorded in Genesis 3, uh, verse 6, the woman stared at the fruit. It looked beautiful and taste. She wanted the wisdom that it would give her, and she ate some of the fruit. Husband was there with her. So she gave some to him, and he ate too. Resulted in Genesis 3, uh, verse 17. And he said to the man, because of what you have done, the ground will be under hills. But when we look at the story of the Cain and Abel, Cain answered to the questions, where is your young brother, Abel? Genesis 4, um, uh, nine, to which he replied, how should 
I know. I am supposed to look after my brother. Go to the rip man from the God. Because you killed Abel and made his blood run out on the ground. You will 11. The, the case of the chain and uh, Cain and Abel is clear demonstration that we are not only to care about how the things we do. Study. Finally, I needed to share with you some story. Actually, Sapson has supposed us uh, some solar project in, in the rural area. It is very interesting, and that make a greater impact because uh, most of the children they come for studying using the, uh, the energy from the solar. But actually, there is a lot of debate nowadays concerning the issue of the energy, something like that. But actually, if you look uh, in Africa, 75% we have uh, enough uh, energy. So why we think about the nuclear? Why what we think about the coal? I think you are supposed to invest a lot in the issue of the in the issue of the solar. I was in uh, Israel in 2019. Really, they invest a lot in the issue. We need to wake up, and then we need to have solidarity to make sure that only the solar project renewable energy. I think Raven Maruta has. Oh, you have frozen. Thank you. We are really struggling to hear you. The sound is breaking up terribly, and you've got a lot of background noise. But um, I'm going to. Thank you for, for your input. And yes, those, those theological discussions are very important to us because they inform what it is that we teach going forward. So it's always good to have those ideas. Thank you. Rue, would you like to? Yeah, thank you, um, um, uh, Barry. I, I just wanted to add uh, to various things that were said. Um, I thought that uh, I wanted to, to say that um, I think that faith and action uh, are ha work hand in hand uh, and that they are kind of sides of this, uh, the same coin, two different sides of the same coin. Uh, I think we need our faith in order to shift our own perspectives on, on how we take action. Um, but obviously our actions also need to inform then our faith. So it's kind of like a bit of a circular process um, while we, uh, I remember in, in some of my studies um, uh, in pastoral care, it was said that you need to read the text of the Bible and you need to also need to read the text uh, of, of human beings. Um, and maybe we can add to that uh, the text of, of, of nature. Um, so, so that's on the side, and, and I agree with the, what has been said about a dominion theology. Um, that we need to shift our perspective. And it takes time to really uh, to do that. And I don't want to go into the details of that now. Um, and then on the, uh, the, the action side, I, I think we need to understand that each one of us are called differently uh, in what kind of work we get involved in. Um, because each one of us have different talents, different interests, uh, and, I, and I believe that God calls us to different, uh, to dif to different aspects of the work uh, and do it obviously also collectively with others that, uh, that uh, share that same interests. Uh, and then I like what uh, Mahatma Gandhi said. He said, uh, God is only called him to take care of the present time. Um, we can't really control the future but we can do what is at hand uh, and that helps uh, for us not to be overwhelmed and to as Gur said uh, to um, to take some concrete action where we are and what we find ourselves uh, able to do uh, and then lastly um, maybe again from Mahatma Gandhi uh, for me it's important uh, for uh, as faith communities that we also think about how we take action uh, and, I, and I believe that uh, nonviolence is an important principle for me personally in terms of that action that we want to take. Uh, we need to also be a bit careful about the paradigm or the words or the metaphors that we use in order to phrase our, uh, our action. 
um, it, it, there's a tendency in our society at the moment to talk a lot about war metaphors. Uh, we have a war against uh, um, uh, violence against women. We have a war against COVID-19. Um, we, we want to say we also must war for the environment. Um, but I think we need to shift to a different paradigm uh, of, of how we take action. It's not a, a sense of opposition but uh, it's, it's both a, 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 a place where we, where we say stop, but where we offer also a hand uh, to help those that we feel that are in the wrong in terms of the environment. Uh, so I just wanted to add those thoughts. I appreciate that enormously because yes, I agree with you completely that we actually need to be solutions based. It's no use jumping up and down and saying, oh, we need to, um, to do something um, without being able to offer something concrete. So thank you so much for that. Reverend Nosi Peterson, I see your hand, but Zainab is first. And if I can please go to Zainab and then I'll come to you, sir. Zainab. Thank you, Betty. I am liking where this conversation is going. and. And um, I like what, what Reverend Rue said about the language use of faith leaders. And so we try to use um, terms or phrases like caring for creation on, on the positive side um, when we talk about faith and environment is how can we care for creation better? Um, and then I also like the way Reverend Ge and Reverend Tora, sorry, I'm also letting people in here. Um, mention about getting involved with organizations that's already, if you're in Zimbabwe, there's organizations doing amazing work. And I think that for, for the longest time, organizations such as HAFSI and, and others has been calling on faith leaders who has the capacity, who has the um, ability and the audience to, to talk to their congregations about caring for creation. And so it's about getting involved um, with organizations or in organizations um, that is doing environmental justice work. And I'm thinking that we have representatives from Southern Africa on the call at the moment. And we're also busy with a campaign against nuclear in Africa. Um, so it's, um, I don't know how much people know about nuclear being rolled out in Africa at the moment by um, the Chinese and Russia. Um, so if people want to get involved there, uh, I can put down my email and people can um, um, email me. Um, if you want to get involved there, but I think it's very important and the time has actually never been more urgent for faith leaders to get involved in these action um, networks. And I'm thinking about, and I'm, I've, I've just looked at faith in action, which is really, really great. But for some reason, I don't see environment on it. I see other important things, and maybe Reverend Kerr can tell us more about that. Um, but if I look at the areas of issues, I don't see environment on it. And is this something that we have to talk more about um, as a faith as faith communities um, in Southern Africa that this that caring for the creation and and environment is one of the most important. Um, um, subjects or topics that needs to, to be addressed um, and looked at as an urgency because as the saying goes, there is no planet B. So we can look at all the other areas that needs our focus, but if we don't have a planet, we, then what can we do? So yeah, that's just my five cents. Thank you, Reverend Berry. Thank you so much, Zainab. Um, Reverend Peterson, it's, um, and yeah, we, that's something we'll come back to Zainab. But Reverend Peterson, the floor is yours. Sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this platform. 
I just want to raise the issue of the primary cause of uh, climate change is referred to as consumerism and capitalist greed. But we sometimes forget the importance of poverty in, 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 in this whole game. Uh, the issue is that poverty is the real danger in, 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 in everything that we're dealing with uh, when it comes to climate change because poverty are being exploited. Just for example, if you look at the, 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 the coal mines in South Africa, about 70% down about that number of the energy uh, is, 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 is received from coal. And now how do you switch from coal mines without adding significantly to the level of unemployment? And uh, the same with the, with the ocean resources, the overfishing and the so-called poaching. Uh, all these things is, is created and caused by poverty. Uh, I, the other day there in the area, not the other day, a few years back, in uh, Hopefield area on the west coast in South Africa, there was this whole thing of the protection of the Fenbos versus the mining of sand in the area. And the argument is always that uh, as job creation, it is uh, a opportunities to alleviate poverty. And uh, at the end of the day, it is these, the, the, the capitalist gimmick that leads to, that have created the poverty. And now, uh, the, the environment has to be raped uh, to eliminate the poverty, but we also know that that is not sustainable. So I think it is important that we also look at these causes of, 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 of uh, the primary source, uh, causes of climate change, which I argue it's consumerism, capitalist greed, and, and, and poverty. And I would just like to hear the views on, on those three issues. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a very that's a, a very interesting and important point as well is is those root causes and how we how we really um, grapple with those. So it's an interesting point also that um, that has been raised in the chat around the question of language and how we actually present ourselves and our language. So it seems we have. Um, almost a polarity, but I believe that there is meeting place. So we have people who are saying that we, we literally, this, this is a war, and there are people saying that war talk is um, something that we should be very careful of and we need to be more gentle in our wording. Um, but how do we be gentle in our wording but remain absolutely strong in our action and in our message? Is there a way to do that so that we, so that the, um, so that we meet with 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 forcefulness, the um, the onslaught, and these are these are these are quite aggressive words. I agree, but we do feel that we are besieged. We do feel that there is an onslaught. We do feel that um, that there is an enormous piece that we are missing that we can't do something about, and we feel a little bit helpless. What do faith leaders do? Our voice is not being heard. How do we make ourselves heard, um, but in a peaceful and reverent way? Um, Reverend Tarai, your hand is raised. Please, you have the floor. You may unmute. Hello. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Barry. Um, there's an old saying which says, uh, action speaks louder than words. So where we feel that um, words are getting maybe too strong in terms of our advocacy role, uh, maybe we really need now to, to re-engage and reconfigure the kind of uh, advocacy actions that we may get into that, uh, that actually go to the grassroots. Uh, uh, I think somebody mentioned about grassroots action where, where we engage the locals, 
um, that way through those actions and when we when we act as much as loud as we can like 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 i was saying earlier on to to speak collectively let's say we have a day that is set aside and on that specific day you have a number of activities happening throughout the region at the same time on the same time tweeting uh, sending messages on Twitter, social media, filled with all. So that's another way of uh, speaking through our actions. So I think that's one way of moving away maybe from uh, the very aggressive tone in terms of our language. Thank you. Yeah, that's, thank you very much, Reverend. And I see that um, Gabriel has put in the chat, instead of fighting, we may talk of tackling the environmental issues. Um, and maybe it's just those kind of nuances um, and yes, uh, Reverend Milan is quite right. Gandhi's power was rooted in his faith. Um, it's a very meaningful conversation. Zainab, you have oh. a <laughs> Sorry. I, I couldn't find the end like Reverend Torah has, has done. Um, I want to make the example that Safsi used, um, and I'm not sure if, if people know about the court case that Safsi has been involved in with the nuclear court case against government um, from 2014 to 2017. So SAFSI, SAFSI and Earth Life Africa won a case against government um, that they cannot have nuclear because they were trying to procure nuclear within South Africa. Um, and the judgment was that the way they went about it was illegal and unconstitutional and SAFSI and Earth Life Africa then won the case. But in the meantime, since, um, since 2015 to 2017, up to the judgment day, SAFSI had every Wednesdays from seven till nine, what we call vigils. So it's not protesting in front of parliament, but actually standing in front of parliament with placards and, and, and singing. So it was a peace, peaceful vigil, what, what we called it, and it wasn't anything, um, uh, so the language wasn't a, um, a violent one, but they also knew that it was a faith group that, um, that, that came there at a, um, in a non-violent manner and a non-violent space. What we also did apart from that was on each bridge um, on the main on the main roads in in Cape Town, like the N2, the N1, the R300, we would have um, those big banners so people can notice the signs um, as they went into work at peak hours in the morning, in the mornings, as they went out to to town side during traffic. So it's those kind of things that we didn't um, do any, um, there wasn't a, it wasn't a violent protest, um, but people knew who we were as a, a multi-faith based community and we did things differently. Um, okay, I, sorry, I'm just reading into the chat. I see my name and it was Reverend. The rule. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the ways. And I think we can, as the a faith community, we can look at these things and not think about um, think about violence or action being um, a, a protest and action being done violently. I always make the example about the faith leaders during the anti-apartheid marches, um, faith leaders in the front holding hands and marching and leading people. Now, although the action was protesting in a violent manner, when the faith leaders stood in front and leading the people, there was no violence. And I think for that reason, we should, we should look at ourselves as leaders of the communities so that people follow our lead. So whatever we, the action that we bring in a non-violent manner, the, the followers will follow on. Um, and that is the, um, uh, the word, um, that is the, 
Ah. Sorry, my English is running so dry. Operandi, the, the standard operational procedure in a way. Well, I, yeah, yeah, but it all, oh, it, it is the power that we have with our, within our faith communities. That is what I'm trying to say. Sorry, <laughs> load shedding in my English. That, those are very, very useful um, ways. Thank you so much, Zena, for sharing that piece of history with us. And I do hear what, um, what I think it's Rev Marutu is saying is that, um, if we're going to be too soft about this, then corruption is going to be with us forever. So these things are all interrelated. All, all the evils that we are facing, all the all the the challenges that we are facing are so interrelated. You cannot separate corruption from the energy and, and climate change issues. So so that's a very, very interesting point that we need to be thinking about as well. But some of those action points that SAFC has taken on in the past, maybe they're still relevant today and maybe they could actually help us. Zainab, thank you. We need to think about how to um, present those to people so that they literally have things in front of them. Mark Lekay has also raised his hand. Mark, Reverend Mark, um, is going to be our last person before we start to um, move on to the next piece. Thank you. Are you muted still? Hold on a second. Reverend Mark, you're muted. There you go. Good afternoon, Reverend Barry. Good afternoon, all. I want to pick up where Reverend Nosey Peterson uh, left. And he made a very important point about um, greed, the economy, and poverty. When it comes to um, caring for creation, it's a very complex um, situation we find ourselves in. I once did in my honors. There was a document um, published by a GAP alternative globalization addressing peoples and earth. And the acronym is AGAPE, where they found that the economy and profit and poverty is actually a deep, deep problem. Um, Zainab referred to the nuclear plants by China and Russia in Africa. But there's also the case where the Western world um, coming to Africa, especially Southern Africa, where they deplete uh, the resources of Africa and the people who live on the land don't see those profits. And where it comes down to is where people living in poverty and deforestation it's a big problem because people are trying to make ends meet. And this is a very complex situation where we find ourselves in it's a, a, it's a situation of um, economy, livelihood, the word that we're using now, livelihood, and poverty. I've watched something on Al Jazeera the other night in um, Northern America where the gas and oil uh, uh, exploration is taking place where part of the community is for the gas explora exploration where the other part of the community is against it because it goes against our cultural and the traditional norms and values. So this thing about the, um, the creation and caring for the earth is deep, is deep where we need to grapple with the deeper issues of uh, what we are dealing with here. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, you're quite right. And that, that issue of poverty, once again, speaks into food security, which I think is going to be the subject of our next um, interfaith dialogue, which will be on the, oh, now I've caught myself hopping. Um, I'll just have to look that up shortly. Um, and Bridget Namondi is also saying in the chat, could participants Google totals pipeline across Africa? And there is a partition to sign um, because this brings to mind BP and Shell's actions in Nigeria, which impacted severely on the Ogoni people, the dedicated activist Ken Saraviwa, who was hanged for his convictions. We have a, we have a history of, of people really suffering for other people's greed. And I, and I agree with you. Poverty is, poverty is 
is diabolical. But how do we work our way around that? So maybe one of the, the opportunities that we have here is to, to work into um, work with the earth in terms of things like food security, which might help to alleviate poverty, in terms of things like water security, in terms of things like energy security. So maybe all of these actions that we take are focused on securing a better life for our people going forward. Um, and, and I like to think that that really is the intention and the bottom line. But it's just about creating that collective action. And Zainab has um, expressed so eloquently and so beautifully how that has happened in one small organization, how we were able to make a difference. And I say we, meaning our collective, because I was not blessed to be part of that particular time in the organization. But it's wonderful to have that as a model to follow. And any of us can follow a model. So we have that. Um, we actually are now running out of time. And one of the things that I wanted to do before, Reverend Tarai, do you still have your hand up from last time or did you have, want to say something more? I saw your hand was up earlier, but I thought that it was just from last time. Uh, no, I think it was from last time. Okay, thank you. Just making sure that I, I don't want anybody to think I'm ignoring them. So the thing that I would like us to do is from our different faith perspectives, and I know that most of us here represent um, the Abrahamic faiths. And I, I did not see, um, I also know, thank you, Mark, for joining us. I also know that, um, unfortunately, our timing to try and juggle around the load shedding that we thought was going to happen and everything, our timing has actually cut into the prayer time for the Islamic community. community. So unfortunately, they were not able to join us for that reason. So. The thing is that I wanted us to find a statement that we could all agree to. And I will share my screen with you now. Um, and here. So this is a potential statement. It was act the wording is actually taken from a, um, from a document that was produced at the policy conference at SAFSI's policy conference in November, and it's taken from the paper on energy and climate justice. So the, we, we're, I'm looking to see whether anybody would like to actually say, yes, um, my community would like to, would agree with everything here. I see that two people have raised hands, but I can't see who they are. Zainab, can you help me? While I'm screen sharing, I can't see. So I'll read this just in case it's because it's quite small and some of you on your phones might be having difficulty with it. Enabling access to energy is a social justice imperative and ensuring that the energy is produced sustainably is an environmental one. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number seven aims to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all by the year 2030. We agree that an urgent transition to renewable energy will be of far greater benefit to the earth and her population than yet more nuclear bills. We encourage faith leaders of every religion and belief system to research and engage communities on this issue and to act in accordance with the directive of our scriptures to do no harm, to take good care of the earth, and to advocate for just, renewable, and sustainable access to electricity for all. That is the bones of a statement. Would anybody like to say anything? I, I don't know where those two hands have gone that I um, Peri, it's um, Sheikh Kasim from Malawi, and then Reverend Torai has his hand up still, I'm not sure. So maybe take Sheikh Kasim first. Please do. Um, I am so happy that Sheikh Kasim has been able to join us. Sheikh, can you unmute him, Zainab? I think you have to invite him to unmute. I'm not host anymore. <laughs> um, oh. Philippine.
Philippine? I've unmuted him. I unmuted okay. him. Okay, thank you. Sheikh Kasim, the floor is yours. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Um, in fact, I just want to agree with my colleagues who have just spoken, more especially on the point of uh, uh, coming together as a family. I remember that time when we went to Cape Town, there was this issue of nuclear um, creation by the African government. We all came together and then we voiced together as one family. So I'm sure that um, if we all do the same in our respective countries, say like when Malawi is um, raising a, a plastic problem or whatever, and then affecting us in the Pacific region, if we uh, come up and then raise alarm to the world, affecting us, I think this will be heard. Um, I'm, I'm also on the point that. Um, uh, as a as if we engage these manufacturing companies to actually put sorry, may I stop you there? A logo sorry, on the we can't hear your 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 sound is breaking up terribly. Hello? I wonder if I can ask you to please type your comment in the chat because we really can't hear you and I don't you want to maybe what maybe you maybe switch your camera off, Chef. Can hear me? Can you switch your camera off and then you can just talk through? So the beginning part of what Sheikh Kasim was saying is that he was part of the the vigils in Cape Town when you can hear me when, now. Um, Sheikh, can you put your camera can you off? Me now? I should have put my camera off. Yes, and then maybe we can hear you better. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to agree with my colleagues um, in the uh, in the religion that uh, coming together as one family will be a very important, um, you know, you know, thing. I remember last time when we went to uh, Cape Town, when there was this issue of nuclear creation um, by the South African government, like Zainab said in the uh, uh, in, in in her uh, presentation. You know, it was heard. People were reading our messages as one family. So my point is that the, uh, as faith leaders, we can also engage these manufacturing companies um, to put a logo on each product they produce, uh, talking about uh, earth keeping. That, that message will also go uh, far abroad. Uh, to each and every person, because if those, two, for example, if a, uh, a sugar manufacturing company is putting a logo on the uh, packet of sugar, talking about uh, creation of the earth, that will also, you know, uh, help to send the message to the to the people. So if we engage all the, if we lobby all the manufacturing companies to do the same, I think our message as faith leaders will also will actually go far and wide. So this is just what I wanted to contribute. Thank you so much. Sheikh, that was, a, that was, a, that was actually a very useful contribution. Thank you so much. Um, I like that idea a lot. And maybe we should, put, um, we should actually, after this meeting, distribute a, a list of potential action points that would support the resolution. We have four minutes left. So I want to just thank everybody who has put their agreement to the resolution in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you very, very much for, to those of you who have agreed to the resolution. Um, what I will do is I will commit to sending that resolution as well as a list of action points that have been mentioned today. And if I miss any, 
then, um, then please feel free to add to them. Um, Rebecca, you are sharing your, no, Tendai, who's sharing a screen now? There we are, thank you. So I'm going to finish off, um, if I may, with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi and a prayer to take us into the future. And I would like to offer that myself. So the quote is this. I bow my head in reverence to our ancestors for their sense of the beautiful in nature and for their foresight in investing beautiful manifestations of nature with a religious significance. Great spirit that flows through each of us, through the air that we breathe, through the ground that supports our feet, through the food that we eat, through the growth, the beauty that we see all around us and from which we are inseparable. We thank you for this time of dialogue and of sharing together. We thank you for the ideas because we know that these ideas that have been shared come not from us, but through us. We thank you for the inspiration and the motivation to take action, to be who it is that we're meant to be and to show up for the people that we lead, for our beliefs and for our faith and for our creation. In this, as in all things, we know that your will is done and let us be your servants always. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on this day. It's been wonderful having this conversation with you. Thank you so much, Reverend Marutu, um, Tendai, Reverend Tendai, and Reverend Ruma Lun for your, um, for your wonderful offerings and your participation. Thank you in absentia to Rabbi Julia Margolis for bringing her such a wonderful statement. I will try to... Um, send those statements and presentations to all of you as well as a follow-up. And please remember that our next, um, oh, I did say that I was going to tell you about this. Our next meeting is going to be on the, um, where are we now? September, it's the third. I think it's going to be at the end of this month, but I'm needing to just, 100% make sure so that I don't lie to you. <laughs> Betty, can you maybe, could, can you email the, the date with all the presentations? I will email the date, um, but I do think it's impossible. It, it's important to give this um, now. It's on the 29th, the 29th of September. Please just mark that date as well. And we'll be sending out invitations. And the subject there will be... Um, will be on food security and climate justice. Hello, Barry. Can you make a, again a speech concerning the date of another meeting, please? Oh, sorry, Betty. <laughs> Betty has gone off. We are currently going into load shedding, but she was saying the 29th of September would be um, the next meeting and she will invite all. She's frozen at the moment. So before I switch off myself, thank you all. Thank you, Zainab, and thank you, Safsi, for the meeting. It was a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wonderful meeting. God bless everyone. Thank you. Bye, Reverend Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. Bye -bye. Bye. Goodbye. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
I enjoy your meat, your harina, your orange juice. Thank you. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. Enjoy everything. Bye. I'll say bye to some of you.